Welcome to the second video in our series on the dynamics of predator-prey interactions. In the last video, we introduced a mathematical model called the lotka volterra model, which involves two equations that predict how prey and predator population densities change over time as a function of predator and prey population densities, intrinsic growth rates, predator efficiency, and intrinsic predator death rates. But this model wasn't perfect. In fact, it was pretty basic. I mean, intentionally so, but it meant that there were ways that it could be modified to make it more applicable. Today, we're going to look at one of those first major iterative improvements on that lotka volterra model, something called the Nicholson-Bailey model. Let's take a look. I should say, before we dive in, that the Nicholson-Bailey model was actually derived with a specific type of predation in mind, parasitoids. Parasitoids lay their eggs inside or on a host organism, which we could also call their prey. When the eggs hatch, the larvae feed on the host, often consuming it entirely during the course of their development and ultimately leading to the host's death. If you remember, the lotka volterra model had some drawbacks. One of them was that it wasn't time-bound. It kind of assumed an endless cyclical interaction between predators and prey. The Nicholson-Bailey model, on the other hand, allows for extinction, and it uses discrete time equations. Let's take a look. In the Nicholson-Bailey model, the prey population still grows exponentially, similar to the lotka volterra model. So we'll start with the variable r, which is the natural growth rate of the prey population. Then we have a variable h, which is the prey population density. If we multiply these together, that will tell us something about what the prey population will look like in the future. Then we need a variable that accounts for the fact that not all of the prey in a given generation will actually survive and become part of the subsequent generation. Some of the prey get eaten, right? So the Nicholson-Bailey model adjusts for this. Only the proportion of prey that escapes parasitism will become part of the next generation. The proportion of prey that survives is represented by e to the negative alpha times p at time t. Okay, there's lots to unpack here. Alpha is a variable that reflects the efficiency of a parasitoid species in finding hosts. You could imagine that this value might vary from one parasitoid species to the next. p is the parasitoid population density. And so p subscript T is just the parasitoid population density at time t. And e, well, e is actually a number, like pi. Pi is 3.14159265 and so on. Pi is a number that represents the ratio of a circle's circumference to the circle's diameter. It's useful in lots of geometric calculations. When it comes to E, the value of E is 2.718, and so on. E is a number that represents the base rate of continuous growth, or decay. It's useful in lots of calculations that involve exponential change, like population growth, or radioactive decay, or compound interest, or predator-prey interactions. So, the prey population density at time t plus 1 is equivalent to the prey growth rate multiplied by the prey population density at time t multiplied by the fraction of these prey that can escape predation. That's calculated based on the value of a standard decay curve relative to the efficiency of parasitoids in finding a host and the parasitoid density. When it comes to the parasitoid population density, well, we'll start with the variable c. This is the average number of viable eggs that are laid on or inside a host, because that's how insect parasitoids reproduce. We then multiply this by prey density, and this gives us an idea of the growth rate of the parasitoids. Next, we multiply by 1 minus e to the negative alpha times p at time t. And you should recognize this very last part. The last part here is the proportion of prey that survived to the next generation. So 1 minus that proportion is the proportion of prey that didn't survive. And why didn't they survive? 
Well, in this model, it's because they were parasitized or parasitoidized. Paras parasitoided? Well, look, they didn't survive because the parasitoids got them. When we graph these together over time, well, first here's something you should know. The Nicholson-Bailey model predicts that in a constant environment, host and parasitoid populations can theoretically exist at equilibrium. But this isn't very stable. Even a small environmental disturbance would cause population oscillations that would grow in amplitude, eventually leading to the local extinction of both the hosts and the parasitoids, which you would think would be fairly detrimental to this model. Well, to explain why real-world populations of hosts and parasitoids actually exist with a degree of stability and don't just go extinct, Nicholson and Bailey proposed that recolonization from other patches could compensate for this threat of local extinction. This is, though, one of the model's limitations. Namely, that the model predicts that even with a small disturbance, the populations would go extinct without rescue from outsiders. There are other limitations of this model. For example, it assumes that parasitoids will search randomly, which isn't entirely accurate. But it does then allow us to predict their use of prey using that standard function. It also assumes that prey are evenly distributed across a landscape. It doesn't account for delays in predator response due to predator growth or predator satiation, nor does it account for prey defenses or cryptic behavior. And the model is really designed specifically for host parasitoid interactions. The model really doesn't do so well with other predator prey systems. And it also, of course, assumes an interaction between just one prey species and just one parasitoid species. All that said, like the Latka Volterra model, the Nicholson Bailey model is a foundational ecological tool that highlights the key dynamics in parasitoid prey interactions. In particular, it showcases the oscillating nature of the parasitoid prey relationships, and it introduces the potential for extinction due to environmental instability. While it is an oversimplified version of what actually happens in nature, the adjustments that it needed inspired research into real-world stabilizing factors, like the movement of individuals between populations and habitat complexity. This makes it a key contribution when it comes to understanding and managing population dynamics. Well, that's enough modeling for one day. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.